China's rare earth export restrictions, tightened dramatically throughout 2025, have pushed American defense contractors into crisis mode. Military stockpiles across the United States now hold barely enough material to sustain operations through the next 90 days. The clock is ticking on a resource choke point that threatens everything from fighter jet production to hypersonic missile programs. The numbers tell a stark story. Fifteen of the 50 critical minerals identified by Washington as strategically essential come entirely from Chinese sources. That's not partial dependence. That's complete reliance. 100%. And now those supply lines are closing. Western tariffs triggered this confrontation. Beijing responded not with rhetoric, but with export controls that rippled through global manufacturing within weeks. By May, Pentagon suppliers were sounding alarms. Rare earth inventories were dropping fast, and replacement sources weren't materializing. The United States tried circumventing restrictions through indirect channels, routing materials through third countries. For a brief window, it worked. Over five months, approximately 3,000 tons moved through alternative pathways into American facilities. But China was watching. Investigators in Beijing traced the shipments and identified the patterns. Thailand emerged as a major transit point, despite having minimal domestic rare earth processing capability. The country operates a single antimony processing facility, outdated equipment, limited throughput, yet import volumes had surged inexplicably. Mexico showed similar anomalies. A processing plant there had been offline for years due to equipment failures. Recently restarted operations couldn't justify the volume of rare earth materials suddenly flowing through Mexican ports. The logic was simple. Neither nation needed those quantities for domestic use. They were intermediaries, importing from China and redirecting to American buyers. Once Beijing confirmed the rerouting, enforcement tightened immediately. Export approvals became conditional. Shipments were tracked end to end. Any deviation from declared purposes triggered recalls or permanent bans on future purchases. India attempted a similar workaround. A consignment of rare earth materials, officially designated for electric vehicle manufacturing, ended up in the production line of a United States defense contractor. Chinese tracking systems flagged the discrepancy. The Indian company involved had submitted over 30 letters of commitment, sworn statements that the materials would remain in civilian applications with no military crossover. Forgeries, all of them. In June, Beijing suspended all rare earth exports to India and blacklisted every entity connected to the scheme. The supply route vanished overnight. These episodes made one thing clear to Washington. Smuggling through proxies wasn't sustainable. A new approach was needed. On July 1, 2025, President Trump convened a quadrilateral security dialogue in Washington. Joined by Japan, Australia, and India, the United States announced the formation of the Indo-Pacific Rare Earth Alliance. The goal was explicit, construct a supply chain independent of Chinese control, reducing structural vulnerability in critical mineral access. The alliance outlined an ambitious framework. Mining, processing, refining, and distribution would be divided among members according to their strengths. Australia would leverage its vast mineral reserves, Japan would contribute advanced manufacturing and refining expertise. India would provide labor and land for processing infrastructure. The United States would coordinate strategy, allocate investment, and set operational standards. If successful, this structure could theoretically diminish reliance on Chinese rare earths and give Washington leverage in future negotiations, offering rare earth access in exchange for technology transfers, market entry, or security commitments. Alongside the alliance, the four nations launched the Critical Minerals Cooperation Initiative. The plan called for synchronized development resource-rich nations handle extraction, industrialized partners provide technical support, and the United States funds major capital projects like new mining sites and processing facilities. On paper, it looked comprehensive. Australia's role is pivotal. The country sits on extraordinary mineral wealth, Iron ore reserves alone exceed 55 billion tons, 
representing over 30% of global deposits. Iron content averages 60% purity, with an estimated economic value surpassing $5.7 trillion. More than 80% of Australia's mineral output is exported, primarily to China, Japan, and India. In 2024, Australian iron ore exports reached $83 billion, accounting for 54.5% of the world's total trade in that commodity. This resource base makes Australia indispensable to any alternative rare earth supply chain. But resources alone don't build industries. Refining capacity is the bottleneck, and China controls approximately 80% of global rare earth refining. Australia has minerals in the ground. Japan has advanced manufacturing technology. The United States excels in research and development. India offers population scale and geographic space. Yet none possess the integrated refining infrastructure that China spent three decades constructing. This isn't just about machinery. It's about institutional knowledge, process optimization, waste management systems, and supply chain coordination that evolved through trial, error, and sustained investment. Linus Corporation, based in Australia, is currently the only non-Chinese entity capable of separating rare earth elements at scale. The company has invested heavily in technological upgrades and capacity expansion over recent years, but progress has been incremental. Critical stages still require Chinese input, either in equipment or technical expertise. Japan has developed capabilities in rare earth recycling, extracting materials from discarded electronics, but even these operations depend heavily on Chinese manufactured equipment. India, despite having rare earth deposits and demographic advantages, lags significantly in technical capacity and manufacturing sophistication. Its economic ties to China remain deep, complicating any effort to decouple. Internal tensions further complicate the alliance. Trump's trade policies, tariff escalations, and defense posturing throughout the year strained relationships with allies, including the three Indo-Pacific partners. On the surface, the coalition presents a united front. Beneath that, divergent national interests and historical grievances create friction. Australia depends economically on Chinese demand for its commodities. Japan maintains complex regional security calculations. India balances its own border disputes and economic ambitions. Coordination among these nations, especially under United States leadership, won't be seamless. Building a rare earth supply chain independent of China isn't a two-year project. It's a generational undertaking. Refining technology alone requires specialized knowledge accumulated through decades of industrial practice. Environmental regulations, waste disposal, chemical processing, quality control, every link in the chain presents technical and financial barriers. China's dominance wasn't achieved quickly, and replicating it will take far longer than current geopolitical timelines allow. The timing of China's response is striking. On the same day Washington announced the Indo-Pacific Rare Earth Alliance, Beijing enacted the most comprehensive mineral resource legislation in nearly 30 years. July 1st marked the official implementation of a new mineral resources law that explicitly designates rare earths as national security lifeline resources. The legal framework criminalizes smuggling with sentences up to 10 years in prison. Export controls now extend across the entire supply chain. Exploration, mining approval, transportation, and international sales, all under centralized state oversight. This isn't incremental policy adjustment. It's a structural shift. Previously, enforcement focused on export quotas and licensing. Now, every stage of production falls under national security protocols. Third-party circumvention the strategy that briefly allowed American companies to access materials through intermediary nations is being systematically closed off. In April, months before the alliance formation, China imposed export restrictions on seven medium and heavy rare earth products, along with specific magnetic materials. Gallium, samarium, terbium, dysprosium, 
These elements, essential for high-performance magnets and electronics, now require detailed end-use declarations, certified user information, and full supply chain documentation. No shipment leaves Chinese jurisdiction without verified traceability from mine to final application. The implications hit hardest in sectors with no alternative supply. A single F-35 fighter jet requires roughly 400 kilograms of rare earth materials. Neodymium iron boron magnets, essential for motors and sensors, are irreplaceable with current technology. Twelve production lines at a major American aerospace manufacturer face potential shutdown due to magnet shortages. The AGM-183 hypersonic missile program has encountered supply disruptions in samarium cobalt alloys, a critical component for high-temperature performance. Pentagon assessments indicate that as many as 1,000 weapon systems have been affected by rare earth supply constraints. The automotive sector faces parallel disruptions. In India, factory floors are filled with partially assembled vehicles, each missing a component the size of a coin, a neodymium iron boron magnet used in electric motors. Without this single part, a $20,000 car remains unsellable. Over 76% of Indian automotive factories report insufficient rare earth inventory, translating to daily losses around $280 million. Globally, more than 300,000 automotive industry workers have been placed on unpaid leave as production lines stall. These aren't abstract supply chain issues, they're immediate economic and strategic vulnerabilities. The United States, despite its technological sophistication and financial resources, cannot simply procure its way out of this dependency. Global rare earth refining capacity is geographically concentrated, and that concentration isn't accidental. It reflects decades of Chinese industrial policy, environmental trade-offs, and capital investment that other nations either avoided or couldn't match. While Washington negotiates resource-sharing agreements and profit distribution among alliance members, Beijing has moved decisively to consolidate control. Legal reforms, technological safeguards, and global supply chain monitoring have been upgraded simultaneously. China isn't reacting defensively its leveraging advantage. The rare earth strategy now forms part of a broader framework for managing critical mineral exports, ensuring that strategic materials serve national interests first. This confrontation extends beyond tariffs and trade balances. It's about control over the foundational materials of modern technology. Rare earth elements enable everything from smartphones to wind turbines, from guided missiles to medical imaging equipment. Whoever controls their supply influences the pace and direction of technological development globally. The Indo-Pacific Rare Earth Alliance represents an attempt to diversify that control, to reduce the strategic risk inherent in single-source dependency. But, you know, diversification requires time, capital, and technical capacity that just doesn't currently exist outside China's borders. Australia's mineral reserves are real. Japan's manufacturing expertise is proven. India's labor force is vast. American financial resources are unmatched. But none of these advantages, even when combined, can quickly replicate the integrated industrial ecosystem that China has built. China's rare earth dominance didn't emerge from resource abundance alone. It actually came from a willingness to absorb environmental costs, from state subsidies that undercut competitors, and from patient capital investment in refining technology when market prices were depressed. Other nations, well, they abandoned rare earth processing because it was unprofitable and environmentally problematic. China absorbed those challenges and, as a result, emerged with monopolistic control. Reversing that dynamic requires not just investment, but a fundamental rethinking of how industrial policy, environmental regulation, and economic strategy intersect. Shutch. The next phase of this competition will be determined not by announcements or alliance formations, but by tangible capacity building. Can Australia scale up refining operations without Chinese equipment? Can Japan develop closed-loop recycling systems that reduce import dependence?
Can India build technical expertise fast enough to contribute meaningfully? Can the United States marshal the political will and financial resources to sustain a multi-decade industrial project? These questions, honestly, don't have easy answers. The rare Earth Challenge exposes a deeper reality about global economic interdependence. Supply chains built over decades can't be restructured in just months or years. Strategic autonomy and critical materials demand sustained commitment, technological innovation, and acceptance of short-term economic pain for long-term security gains. China's export restrictions have forced a reckoning. The era of unrestricted access to critical minerals is ending. Nations that depend on these materials for defense, technology, and economic growth must now choose between accommodation and autonomy. The Indo-Pacific Rare Earth Alliance is, in a way, Washington's bet on autonomy. But, you know, success isn't guaranteed. The path forward will be defined by technical breakthroughs, diplomatic cohesion, and strategic patience, qualities that are honestly in short supply in contemporary geopolitics. As Beijing tightens control and Washington builds alternatives, the global economy enters uncharted territory. Rare earth elements, once obscure materials known mainly to engineers and geologists, have become tools of statecraft. The competition isn't just economic, it's existential. Whoever secures reliable access to these materials will shape the technologies, weapon systems, and industries of the coming decades. The struggle has only begun, and the outcome remains uncertain.